we prepare to look at 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 9 tonight, um, it's important to know that we're going to start off with the church asking the Apostle Paul a question. And Paul's responding to that question, and that's the context for this chapter. Chapter 7 is a response to the church and the question that they have because of the culture in which they live uh, is highly immoral. It's a highly uh, hypersex community and culture that they live in. And the Apostle Paul has already talked to them about some wrong relationships in chapter 5 and then kind of gave them the theological reason for why they should handle their sex lives properly in chapter 6, 12 through 20. But then Paul comes back in chapter 7 and talks about how to get this thing right. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 through 9, the Apostle Paul writes these words. Now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, but because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, also, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But this I say by way of concession, not of command, yet I wish that all men were even as I myself am. However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry. For it is better to, bury, better to marry than to burn with passion. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Heavenly Father, may the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be holy and acceptable in your sight. God, Lord, we pray that you would take the words of God this evening through the Apostle Paul, Lord, and explain to us as a church what you desire for us to see. God, we ask that you would open up our eyes to the correct understanding of the Word of God, Lord, that you'd open up our hearts, God, that we might receive the things spoken by God through the Word of God, by the Spirit of God. And Lord, we just come to you right now simply saying show us the truth and God conform us to it it's in your son's name that we pray amen and thank God first Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1 through 9 we're going to be dealing with the subject more sex less headaches more sex less headaches as we deal with first Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1 through 9 more sex less headaches we want to focus in on the key question and that question simply being, is your sex life, listen very carefully, spirit-led, self-led, or Satan-led? One of the things about the sex life in which you and I engage in, we will find out that our sex lives are either spirit-led, they're either self-led, and or they are Satan-led. Here's the interesting thing about that, is that only when your sex life or my sex life, our sex lives, are spirit-led, are we going to be in the right direction. Now, I'm thankful that we're dealing with a mature audience and that this is not just going to be some funny subject. Because it's going to be something that I think that if we really get it and understand it, it will improve and it will line us up with the things that God has designed for our marriages and our relationships. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul is responding to a letter that has been written to him by the Corinthians. Paul is in constant communication with the Corinthian church. We talked about a couple weeks ago that Paul had written the Corinthians a letter and that that letter some kind of way got lost. And so Paul is writing what is now known as 1 Corinthians, which is really 2 Corinthians, because the previous letter that he wrote them was lost. And then Paul is now getting a letter from them to where they're writing the Apostle Paul, and, and Paul is communicating back with them. And based on the culture that they live in, a hypersex culture to where they had temples, uh, where they worshipped 
uh, their false gods through false relationships and sexual immorality, uh, Paul is now trying to respond to their question based on them living in that type of culture and say, here's Christ and Christ's way over what the culture is offering. Now, this is important because, uh, as I've said and mentioned so many times, that oftentimes the church is silent in this area. And because the church has been silent in this area, uh, the culture has grasped it and grabbed it and taken control of it. And when you speak on it in the church, people uh, act like they don't know what you're talking about. And yet, God, being the manufacturer of sex, is the one who laid it out and is the one that has the perfect design for all of us. And so when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, he says, Now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Paul starts out with this statement because they're writing him in light of relationships, not just in light of marriage. They're writing him in light of relationships. And so that term uh, for a man to touch a woman was a Corinthian colloquialism, just like food is for the body, the body is for food. It was a colloquialism talking about get her heated, get her heated, get her hot. And Paul says, based on what your culture says, let me address your subject matter. And Paul says, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, you got to check out what Paul said. Paul did not say, which is getting ready to come up, it's, good for, it's not good for a husband to touch a wife. But what Paul did say is it's not good for a man to touch a woman. Now, hold up, Paul. What are you trying to say right there? What Paul is saying is just because you're engaged in a heterosexual relationship, I'm not talking about homosexual or lesbian, Paul is saying just because you're involved in a heterosexual relationship that you can go too far and you can actually think that your stuff is okay because at least it's heterosexual, theirs is homosexual or lesbian, and Paul is saying it ain't okay if it's just a man or a woman. And Paul begins to address this issue. And so here's what we're going to deal with. The Corinthians' que the question concerning relationships and sex was answered, not avoided. This is big. Paul does not avoid, shrink back, and or not a deal with or address the issue that the Corinthians are asking him about. Paul does not shrink back, does not acquiesce. Paul addresses this issue because he wants the church to know the truth concerning what God has lined out and or ordained for the church. And here's what Paul does. The Corinthians are cautioned that close physical proximity will likely lead to sexual promiscuity. Paul says that if you're in a relationship dating and you get involved in close physical proximity, and you're in a relationship, and y'all get to hugging and rubbing. He said, it's going to lead down the wrong road. So Paul says it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, the word touch in the Greek language means to stir a flame in her, to kindle a flame, to get her started. And Paul says that once you get her started, it's going to go in a natural direction that you don't want it to go. Why? Because it's just male and female boyfriend and girlfriend or something like that. It's not husband and wife. And so Paul begins to let us know is that when you talk about blessed sex, that blessed sex is always between husband and wife. That Genesis chapter 1, 26 through 28, and God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. He was talking about the context of a man marrying his wife and them getting together and then procreating. In Genesis 2, 24 and 25, he says, and the two shall become one flesh, talking about husband and wife. That's all under God's blessing. Proverbs 5, 15 through 20, uh, be blessed with the wife of your youth. That's under God's blessing, recreational sex. And then 1 Corinthians 7, 5 that we'll look at in just a minute, where God protects us from satanic attack, that's all under God's blessing. But here's the thing that many of us did not know, just like the Corinthians growing up in a Gentile world culture, is that I, my basic mentality was, was if I don't get a girl pregnant, if I don't get a disease, I've done all right. Anybody got that mentality? Anybody was, you know, that was your general concept, amen? You didn't get nobody pregnant. I ain't hurt nobody. I ain't making no babies. You know, I ain't got nothing, amen? I'm, I'm good. And the reason why is because that was a cultural standard. So as long as you didn't get anybody pregnant, as long as you didn't get a disease and something bad happened as a result of this thing, 
because we never thought what we were doing when we were just boyfriend and girlfriend was bad in the first place. Nobody was back in the world, you know, doing a thing to me, oh, that was bad. And walking off disappointed. Now, it might not have been that good and you walked off disappointed, but, but it wasn't because what you thought that you were going to get into was going to be all right, all right? So, so, so Paul wants them to know, hey, be careful of this physical proximity thing. Now, I want you to deal with this word touch. Go back to Genesis chapter 20, verse 1 through 6. Paul said it's, it's good, it's not good that a man touch a woman. In Genesis chapter 20, verse 1 through 6, Genesis chapter 20, Abraham has offered out his wife, Sarah, for the second time. When God blesses Abraham, God sends him out and God offers uh, Abraham a covenant. And what Abraham ends up doing is Abraham ends up running into Pharaoh and he says, they're going to see that my wife is beautiful. And so I'm going to tell her to tell Pharaoh she's my sister. And he offers his wife out once. And then God protects her and brings her home. But He's going to offer her out a second time to Abimelech. He offers his wife out a second time some 20 years later because his wife is still good looking and still fine. And he thinks that Abimelech's going to kill him. And so watch what happens. In Genesis chapter 20, it says, Now Abraham journeyed from there toward the land of the Negev and settled between Kadesh and Shur. And then he sojourned in Gera. Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, She is my sister. So Abimelech, king of Gerah, sent and took her. He took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream of the night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is married. You're a dead man. For the woman that you have taken is married. Now Abimelech had not come near to her. Check out that language. And he said, Lord, will you slay a nation even though blameless? Did he himself not say she is my sister? And she uh, said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and in the innocence of my hands, I have done this. Now check out verse 6. This is it. Then God said to him in the dream, yes, I know that in the integrity of your heart you have done this. And I also kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Underline. Y'all see that? Y'all see the word touch? Go over to 1 Corinthians 7, verse uh, uh, 1. Underline, mark it right there. Verse 6. He said, I did not let you touch her. God sovereignly did not allow Abimelech to touch Sarah, although he wanted to get to her. That sometimes what you need to know from this text is that God protected you sexually when you didn't want to be protected. That God held you back from some stuff that you and I were getting ready to get in, and God did not allow some stuff to go down that could have gone down a bad way. And he says, Abimelech, you wanted her, but I was the one who stopped you from touching her because she was mine. And she's not only mine, she was Abraham's. And, I'm, and, and she's a married woman, and so God says, I don't want you to have a man to touch a woman. Now, here's the deal. He starts out right there, but walk with me to Proverbs 6, verse 26. Proverbs 6, verse 26. In Proverbs chapter 6, verse 26, it's in the section of 5, 6, and 7, where Solomon, just like Paul writes three chapters about sexual issues in Corinth, Solomon writes three chapters in the book of Proverbs specifically dealing with the issues of his sons and immorality and the adulterous woman and how to avoid her and find the right woman. But in Proverbs 6, verse 26, he says, start right there. He says, for on account of a harlot, one is reduced to a loaf of bread and an adulteress hunts for the precious life. Verse 27 here it is. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Or can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? Uh, now notice this. So is the one who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever hears that word touches her will not go unpunished. Did you catch that? Now notice this. He says, can a man take fire in his bosom? He's saying, man, look here. This is the breakdown. 
You know, you know, you know like when you play ball with the brothers and you, you dap up like that and y'all score a touchdown and y'all bumping through the chest bump and all that, 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 that's like dude on dude chess. But he said, can a man take fire in the bosom? Now you hold in the female, that thing's a little softer than when you, than when you did the, the chest bump with the fellas. And what God is saying is, when that thing gets that close, man, the heart's beating funny, the mind is thinking funny, the palms are sweaty, and he says, and you're not going to get that close to her and not get burnt. You're not going to walk on hot co coils and not get burnt. You're not going to start down the road and it not go somewhere that it's not designed to go. So what he's, Paul is dealing with is Paul said, I'm letting you know that when you're just a man and or a woman, based on the question that you all are asking me, if it's not marriage, it's inaccurate. Are you following me? Paul is trying to let them know that do not think that a relationship outside of marriage is okay. Now the problem is, is the depth of the Corinthian mindset living in that culture. Their mindset is sexually anything goes. And when you come from a mindset and a culture to where anything goes, you don't understand when God tries to redirect you another way. Now, when you and I begin to think about this, this title tonight, More Sex, Less Headaches, you, you got to look at it in a variety of different ways. Because you and I, who have engaged in so-called sexual activity outside the marriage covenant, we got some headaches from that sex. Hello, somebody? Now, I know y'all nervous in the service tonight, but y'all going to be all right in just a second, amen? Now, you got some headaches you got some heartaches from some people, male and female side of the equation, that left you, that you thought you gave them everything, and they got on down the road and moved on down the road. You had both headaches and heartaches. And God is showing them, and he's showing the Apostle Paul, to teach the people, man, you're going to get some headaches and some heartaches from this thing. If you do it the wrong way, you're going to get some headaches and some heartaches. And let's walk back to 1 Corinthians 7. So Paul starts out letting them know, hey, I want to caution you all relationally to don't think that anything just goes. Because in this very same culture, Paul has already addressed the issues of homosexuality in chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. And he's already told you that people from both heterosexual background and homosexual background have been saved, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Paul's already addressed that. But what Paul is dealing with right now is the question that you're asking me, is it okay if anything goes down, male and female? And so Paul says this, verse 1, Now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now here is the good news about this, is that Paul has an open line of communication and conversation when it comes down to intimate issues. And here's the problem. The church has not had an open conversation from God's perspective with one another to set each other free. And so now the deal is, is that we come and we listen to the word of God through a lens already informed by the culture and not by Christ. And we determine whether or not what's being said is okay with us, not based on the scripture, but based on what we heard in the streets. And the street becomes the chief teacher of our sex lives, not the scripture. Now, now, here's the deal. How can the street teach better than the scripture when the scripture was designed by the Holy Spirit, designed by Jesus, designed by God the Father, who was the one who created sex? Always make sure that you go back to the original that you might get the best out of something. Notice this. He transitions, though. He goes to verse 2. But because of immoralities, underline that word, because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. Now notice this, he transitions out of a man touching a woman and a woman touching a man, that, that, that's not good. And now he says, but because of immoralities. Because he says where that's going to lead is it's going to lead to that Greek word pornoneia slash porno pornography, which means, listen, write it down, all forms of of illicit sex outside the marriage covenant. Listen to me. All forms of illicit sex outside the marriage covenant. Now this is the stuff that ain't nobody tell us 
in the locker room. No, no, nobody gave us this view. So he says, but because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. So God says, if you're going to get this intimately involved, if you're going, ladies, to give everything away, if you're going, brother, to give everything away, give everything away. If, if you're willing to go all the way, go all the way. Go all the way and get married. Lest you not understand the value of what you're engaging in. Let's look at this next one. The Corinthians are instructed to correct their sexual morality through relational matrimony. Here, here's how I want to correct your sexual immorality. I want you to move towards relational matrimony. See, if you're already dating, if you're already engaged in a relationship, there's some form of commitment. But here's the deal. You want a playhouse, but you don't want to make a home. See, 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 see you, want, you want the privileges of what married people have. You just don't want the commitment to what married people do. Now, the older we get, though, we'll start living together. We'll start paying bills together. We'll start going to H-E-B together. We'll start doing all that kind of stuff, but we're just not, we just not married. And, then, and here's the deal. Here's what he lays down on you, ladies. We well, see that that gets complicated. Like what we have right now is just what we have. And like this thing is kind of unique, you know what I'm saying? And so like I don't want it to get complicated with all that like ring and ceremony and all that. And so because, you know, you know what we got, you know what I'm saying? And you'd be like, oh, yeah, I know, I know what you're saying. And the reason why you say you know what he's saying is because you don't want to lose him because you've already given up everything. And because you've already given up everything, you don't want to lose him because then you got to, in your mind, start over. And you can only see yourself with this one because you've already made yourself mentally and emotionally his wife, but he hasn't committed nothing to you. Check out the text. He says, watch this. He says real quick. But because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife and each woman is to have her own husband. Now notice that. He says, if the man is willing to go there, and watch this, he cannot go there by himself. He goes there with you. If you're going to go there, get it out of the category of immorality, sexual immorality, and get it in the category of sex. Erase your immoral problem by, see, see, if you're going to make that deep of a commitment where you're giving yourself up, male and female, go ahead and make the commitment. Now, here's the deal. So here's the, here, will you marry me? Now, that changed everything. No, I, you know, hey, 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 you know, you're kind of pushy. You, you, you're getting a little pushy. I mean, like, you know, and so now all of a sudden you're pushy for asking him to marry you. Hey, hey, I, I thought we were just having fun. You know, I, I thought this was, was simple. Now you're making things complicated. And so now y'all will, no, I'm not trying to make it complicated. I'm just trying to know what level of commitment do we have? What is this? Can you explain? Well, I can explain it, man. Ain't nobody else in the room but me and you. I ain't, ain't no other honeys. I ain't got no other phone calls in my phone. It's just me and you. So why you got to take it all there? Oh, man, he, look here. I mean, like, like I'm, I'm here with you now. What you mean, what is this? And, and, and you there, man. You, yeah, oh, I know, I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to. And he got you with that thing. Why? Because mentally and emotionally, you were already gone. Now, y'all, man, you know, I'm, I, I'm talking about the male side of the thing. Y'all, we know what we're coming for. We know what we're coming for. And in the mind of a man knows exactly what he's coming for, and he will hit every susceptible woman he can. And you're susceptible because you made yourself available. But then when you say, I'm worth something, then that'll show you what he really thinks about you. And watch this. On the other side of this, you got some female players now too, Doc. Brothers, 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 brothers. They, they done learned game after all these years. 
They tired of being hurt, all right? So they keep two, three on the side and all that kind of jazz. They, they keep a dude to pay the bills and all that. He got a real job. You don't, you know what I'm saying? She got a dude over, over here. She like you because you still young, but he got the bills over here. So, so you have to understand, Paul says, if you're going to do this relationship thing, value marriage. Now notice this. Each man should have his own wife. And each woman should have her own husband. Now he gets into the issue of individual commitment to where it's one-on-one. -on -one. That there ought to be a woman who takes you off the market because she's that valuable. And there ought to be a man who takes you off the market because you value him that much. And when this man becomes a husband and she becomes a wife, if you don't understand that the chief picture of a husband is Jesus, husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. Wives, submit to your husband as unto the Lord. So in essence, ladies, if you don't see your husband or this man as the Lord, you might need to break up with him. Rewind, press, play, because you ain't get that. Because you done already gave it up, and so now you're already connected. So here's the deal. If you don't see him as the Lord, and you could submit to him the same way you submit to Jesus, see, there's some things in your life that the word of God convicts you of and you want to do wrong and you desire based on the flesh in that battle within to do this but the Holy Spirit pulls you back to the Lord and you say I want to do this but I'm going to submit to the Lord it was a struggle but I submitted to the Lord if you don't have a man that you can submit to like that you ain't got no man that when you see your man, do you see a representative of the Lord that's calling you into submission because of his love for you like Christ loved the church? Giving himself up for you and sacrificing himself for you and trying to wash you in the water. But here's the problem. See, brother now starts talking to you about the scriptures and there ain't no dude ever talked to you about the Bible. So now you got a problem with this dude. Oh, you beat me down with the Bible. At least he brought the Bible up. So now he's in a fight, you're in a fight with each other as she tries to submit to you and expects you to be godly, but you don't want to be your role. The biggest compliment to any man is that you were designed to look like Jesus. Listen to me, the male, God giving you maleness was designed to make you be the visual representation of Jesus Christ in your home. It's the biggest compliment you'll ever get. Watch this. So it says, but each, but because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife and each woman is to have her own husband. Simply put, relationally, here's the deal, is that everybody eventually knows where a relationship is going. Everybody eventually knows where a relationship is going. Notice what he said. It's good for a man not to touch a woman. It's good for a man not to touch a woman. But because of immoralities... Each man is to have his own wife, and each wife is to have her own husband. Now, peep this out. When you lose your virginity, you dated this guy nine months, ten months, eleven months, maybe a year, and finally, back in the day, you lose your virginity. You dated that guy one year. But guess what? Six months later, y'all break up. So when you start with the next guy, because you already know what it feels like, and he begins to touch you. Now, you waited a long time. So you were like 18, 17, whatever, when you finally lost your virginity. But, and you dated this guy 10 months. But the next guy, it don't take him 10 months. How many months did it take him? Y'all don't answer. Please don't answer. <laughs> it, it, it takes him six months. I'll tell the story. I'll, I'll tell the story. I'll, I'll tell the story. It, 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 it takes him six months, all right? But about nine months after that, y'all break up. So when the next guy comes, it only takes him two months. When the next guy comes, it only takes him two days. Why? 
because of immoralities, this has now led you into a road to where you're increasingly giving yourself away, yet still single and engaging in more immorality, both male and female side. Now watch this. Can I give you something? Most men, I'm going to be straight up honest with you, we don't want to wait. We want to wait until you're ready to stop waiting. Now you need to, you need to write that down. You might, you might want to write that down. Most men don't want to wait. We're willing to wait until you want to stop waiting. Now, I didn't see no pens doing what they need to be doing. Tight. You better put that down somewhere. Put it on your refrigerator. Put it on your mirror in the morning. You need to understand. Now, we, we don't want to do nothing foul, but we will wait until you quit waiting. Amen? Listen to it. Because of immoralities. Because everybody knows eventually where a male and female relationship is going. It's, it, it, it's going down that road. It, it, it can only get closer to that road. Why? Because that's the way God designed it. God naturally designed our relationship to go there. But God designed it to go there in the context of marriage. So God has no issue with it in marriage. He's got issue with it outside of marriage. And that's what he's addressing. So he said, now let's address that issue through matrimony. Now go with me to Deuteronomy 22, verse 28 and 29. Deuteronomy 22, verse 28 and 29. This is interesting. Because one of the things that we have to learn is that we have various views about various sins. And oftentimes, heterosexual sinners think that they're in better shape than homosexual sinners. Or, or lesbian-based sinners. Because our sin is at least natural. It's what was supposed to happen. Now watch this. I want, you, I want you to see something. Because here's the deal. In our minds, boyfriend and girlfriend relationship, you and I believe that we had consensual sex. Consensual sex means we're both adults, we both agreed, we both knew what we were going on, uh, we loved each other, we were dating, we've been dating this long time, and so we had consensual sex. Notice this, God never says you had consensual sex outside the marriage covenant. Check out Deuteronomy 22, verse 28 and 29. So he says this, Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 28. He says, if a man finds a girl, underline, who is a virgin, who is not engaged. She's got no commitment, no ring. She's a virgin. She's done the right thing. And he seizes her and he lies with her, and they are discovered. Then the man who lay with her shall give to the girl's father 50 shekels of silver. Now notice, he immediately ties the sexual act between the man and the woman, the unengaged single girl virgin, to the dad. Did you catch that? He immediately ties the act to the dad. It go right down next to Deuteronomy 22, 28, and 29, Exodus 22, 16, and 17. This is the physical payment of the bride price. Please write this down. I'm going to go back to it. Now watch. He must give the girl's father 50 shekels of silver, and she shall become his what? Because he has what? Did you see that? Violated her. Now this is not the text about rape. The text about rape is 25 through 27. So that's earlier. This is not about rape. This is about he seized her, he lied with her, he found her, they got together, they had a relationship, and the text says he violated her. All right? The previous text is about rape. Notice this. And he cannot divorce her all of his days. So when God sees this couple engaged in sexual relationship, God automatically sees marriage and payment due. All right? Now notice what God said. He violated her. So from God's perspective, no male ever had consensual sex with any woman, notice this, as a boyfriend that God didn't view as a violation. Throughout all of human history, every boyfriend, every man, one night stand, whatever it is, they, oh no, man, we, we met in the club, we were doing, we dancing, man. I mean, like, she, I mean, we, I mean, oh, we, we were flowing together like that. I mean, we had to move there. Oh, it was like our body was moving in motion together, you know, and, and, man, and we just left from there and took that to the bedroom. And it was all good. We weren't even drunk. So, so, so watch this. That was consensual. God says, violation. 
There's never been a sexual act that we have been engaged with with anybody outside the marriage covenant that God does not say violation. You know why he says violation? Because he sees no bride payment being made. That if you are going to have sex, I need agreement from the father. So 22, 13 through 19, he had talked about when y'all get married, I need the sheets and have evidence. All right? So you need to understand that God always sees this thing and he connects it to marriage. God never connects a sex act by itself not to marriage. Walk with me to Exodus 22, 16 and 17. The 50 shekels of silver is actually five years of salary that the man had to pay for you. So the man had to save five years of his salary and make a payment for your, for your virginity to the father because watch this now. You were in an agricultural society, and you worked on the field for your father. And so you brought things in. You brought water in. You fed the camels. So you were productive. The father just left, lost you because you were, you, you were taken off. So the man had to pay a value of what was lost for you. So God has always assigned a value to you women. And so if God thinks that a dude ought to save five years of salary just to marry you, if you're a virgin, he can't spend a dime for five years, then there's a value on you, but you're giving it up because he didn't took you to the prom. He's in a rented tuxedo, a rented tuxedo. He's in his uncle's car. It's the best car in the family. And you done gave it up, and he let you biggie size it. He let you water size it. Hey, you went to Papa Do's and, and you wanted to order like the fresh squeeze uh, uh, lemonade. No, 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 no. You got to pay for all them. Go on, get her that regular lemonade. Oh, that's fine. I'll, I'll take the regular. Why? Because you ain't that valuable. Walk with me to Exodus 22, 16 and 17. Notice this. Check out how he seized her. Check out how he sees her. Watch. Deuteronomy 22, 28, 29, you need to write it down next to Exodus 22, 16, and 17. We're in Exodus 22, 16, and 17. And notice this. God is talking to the saved Israelites, and this is after the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, verse 14, thou shalt not commit adultery. So he's talking to saved people. He's not talking to unsaved people. He's talking to his covenant people, the Israelites. And check out what can happen in the Israelite covenant people community. If a man seduces a virgin, basically talks to her so smooth that he gets her so mentally lax that the draws come off. Watch this. If a man seduces a virgin who is not engaged, that in Deuteronomy 22, 28, the exact same girl, and he lies with her. So a good covenant girl from the church who's a virgin can get talked to so sweet don't think you all that that you end up giving it up now watch this he lies with her he must pay a dowry or the bride price for her to be his what girlfriend god always sees wife if her father refuses to give her to him why because man he got my daughter before the time he shall pay money equal to the dowry for virgins now, the actual dowry was what we just read in Deuteronomy 22, 28, and 29. So, ladies, you and I have to know our value. Brothers, we have to know that God wants us to be wealthy enough to pay for the sister and her value. Uh, let me rewind and press play. God does not just have a value on her, on how valuable she is. God is showing her how wealthy you are. You didn't get it. Jesus Christ saw a value on you, and because of the wealth of the riches of his grace, he was able to pay for you and make you his wife, and you will be his eternal bride. Are you following me? Now watch this. And Jesus didn't get a fresh virgin when he got us and paid the ultimate price. And if Jesus will pay the price for sluts like you and I, what will you pay the price for this young lady? Y'all, we are filthy and Christ paid the highest price. 
But as long as you see this as what I want sexually and not what Jesus did spiritually in a marriage relationship with us, we won't understand. Let's walk back. 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7. Notice this. 1 Corinthians 7. We're now moving to verse 3. So here's the deal. The Corinthians are instructed to correct their sexual immorality through relational matrimony. I want to ask you this question. Ladies, how valuable are you? And brothers, how big time are you to make sure that you can make the payment? Now here's the thing. For those of us who have children, sons and daughters, we need to be teaching them this. God expects son for you to be able to have this, to take care of her. God expects, young lady, for you to know this. He can't tell you a couple jokes, throw a touchdown on a football field that had nothing to do with you and have the right to you after the game. Watch this. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3. Now, he transitions from the man not touching the woman to correcting that thing by each man having his own wife each wife having her own husband, to now he goes into, let's work this thing out. Verse 3, the husband must fulfill his underlying his work duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. Let's check out this verse 3. The Corinthians are instructed to practice, check this out, sexual liberty and quality in the blessing of matrimony. Y'all, y'all didn't get that thing. Watch it. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. Now what God is simply saying here is that as you get into the marriage covenant and you are now married, the husband has a responsibility given to him by God to make sure that when he's with his wife that he's doing everything he can to please his wife under the covenant of blessed sex. The husband has a duty to his wife, which means that when the husband comes to the sex bed, his primary focus is on the wife, not on himself. The wife has to fulfill her duty to her husband. Her primary focus is pleasing the husband, not herself. Y'all ain't getting this thing. Because if you know that you're involved with a partner who his priority or her priority goal is to please you, you never have to worry about yourself. Okay, y'all don't know when to clap. Say amen. See, see, if a brother's coming to the room like, baby, I got it. Talk to me. Let's make sure we straight tonight and you get all you ever wanted. That, that's what the book is saying. Now, he doesn't have to worry about what's going down on his side because you already got the same mindset. So now nobody has to sexually come to the bedroom thinking about themselves. See, what happens oftentimes is, see, when your sex life is spirit-led, your sex life is also service-led. Rewind, press play. When your sex life is spirit-led, it's also service-led. It's not selfish. It's, hey, my job, my responsibility today, tonight, at lunch, at dinner, when you come home early, my responsibility is you. Yo, this, this is biblical, all biblical you can get. But when you come with that little selfish mindset, man, folk get frustrated. Folk get frustrated because, look here, man, you, you, ain't, you, ain't, you don't know me. You, you don't know me. The Bible says Adam knew Eve. He knew Eve. The reason why, if you listen to the Proverb literature, chapter 5, uh, we'll read it in just a second. If you really understand it, the reason why God never wanted you to be with anybody else besides your spouse is that you would have a lifetime of discovery of one another. Y'all, y'all listen to me. It's in Proverbs 5. We just ain't got you yet. I'm going to get you there. But God is saying that when you get in this marriage, he says the husband, no, check out the text, verse 3, must fulfill, must fulfill. It ain't optional. Hello, somebody? Must fulfill his duty to his wife 
and likewise the wife to her husband. So now notice this. It means, can I give it to you plain? Yes. Y'all have some good sex. Your number one responsibility in the bedroom is to have some good sex. God blessed sex. There's no more responsibility. Now here's the deal. When you know that that's the case, then you know that God's hand is on it. You can see God saying, and I'm, I'm going to go to Proverbs 5, bless it. Now watch this. This is good news because there is the part of the text where we're going to get to the quantity of sex. Hello, somebody. We're going to get to the quantity. That's coming up. But he's also saying the quality. The quality. That means you got to put the kids down sometime. Seven o'clock, y'all going to bed. All that kid up at 10, that's of the devil, because you know somebody's going to be tired right after that. Now, watch this. Dude, we got to energize a bunny battery. It don't matter. Y'all worried about sleep. Dude, ain't worried about no sleep. We'll miss sleep all day, all night long. So here's the deal. Reality, put them kids to bed early. Plan some stuff, amen. Hey, tonight, baby, it's on. Okay, now, now look here. I, I don't need, we ain't talking to the kids. We ain't asking no more questions. They can do, they can figure it out. If they ain't dead by the morning, that'd be just too bad, amen. But now, he's talking about the quality. The quality must fulfill your duty, your responsibility. That's God. That's God saying this. Watch this. And then he says, the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. Now, here's the good news. Go back with me to Proverbs 5, verse 15 through 20. See, because the church is bound and not free when it comes to sex, the divorce rate in the church is the same of the divorce rate in the world. But yet you haven't read 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. This says that the Christian ought to be experiencing a better quality marriage than anybody else. Look at the, look at the statistics. And it's because the church is bound. Y'all, see, when you're selfish, and I'm going to get there in just a second, when you're selfish in your sex life, you don't realize, I'm trying not to get ahead of myself, you don't realize you might be positioning your mate for an affair. That's male and female. Proverbs 5, 15 through 20. You can have a headache all you want to, but you're going to have some worse ones in a minute. Check out, check out Proverbs 5, verse 15. Proverbs 5, 15 through 20, he's talking to his sons about avoiding immorality in the adulterous woman in basically 1 through 14. But he gets to verse 15, and he says, drink water from your own cistern. Now notice that word own, own, possessive. You, 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 it's your own. Just like you got to have your own wife, your own husband. Drink water from your own cistern. Fresh water from your own well. Now notice that it's fresh. You catch that? It's designed not to be polluted. So that, brother, when you get your wife, she, the cistern being a euphemism for her vagina, is supposed to be fresh. It's not supposed to have had any other thing dipped down in the well and pulled out of it. Amen? Jacob had a well in John chapter 4. John, Jesus, Jesus was at the well with the woman caught at the adultery. See, you're, not, you're supposed to come and put your bucket in the well and pull your bucket out and get fresh water. Ain't supposed to be no other bucket in the well before you get to it. That's the book. Drink water from your own sister. Now, I don't know what that means. Y'all put that on yourselves, amen. Uh, fresh water. From your own well. Now watch this. Verse 16. Should your springs be dispersed abroad? Streams of water in the streets? Should you be, brothers, spilling your sperm anywhere? Springs dispersed abroad? Should your sperm be all over here? And should Quake and Shanika and all this over here? And Ray Menina and all that? And should it be? No, no, no. He said, no, man. Bring your stuff to your wife. Why? Because notice this. We think as long as she's a virgin, we got a prize. We want to have worked out some stuff. No. You're supposed to discover everything with her in the first place. So you don't want to be bringing 25 females to the bedroom either, brother. 
Should your springs be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets? Let them be, here it is, yours alone and not for strangers with you. Did y'all catch that? See, here's the deal. God never wanted your marriage bed to be bringing strangers in it. So here's the deal. Some of the things that I'm trying on you, I'm trying it on you because it worked for her. Royce, Royce, Royce. So you don't know what I'm trying on you right now is because it worked on her. Roll over right there. Not for strangers with you. See, they're not in the bed with you, but they're in your mind. They're, they're in your memory log. And she's comparing brothers, and you're comparing. You think you all that, brother? Yeah, man, I'm bringing this best game. Doc, you know how I do, man. You know how I do? Uh-huh. It was another brother, Doc. He was in the gym more than you, amen? Doc, that brother, you know, was on swim team. He, he got a little bit more endurance than you, Doc. He, he ran track. He, he can go a little longer than you, brother. Don't, don't, don't be, you know, hey. Check out the text. Verse 17. Let them be yours alone and not for strangers with you. Now check out 18. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. Now, y'all, whenever you walk up to a water fountain, you press it, and what happens? See, he says, let your fountain be blessed. Brother, every time you ought to walk up to it, it ought to, in other words, it ought to always be on. It ought to always be on. This is the book. See, y'all mad, but it's the book. Let your fountain be blessed. You're going to get a blessing tonight versus a curse. Here it is right here. And rejoice in the wife of your youth. Now watch this. As a loving hind is a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. Now watch this. He says, man, here's the deal. Man, let her breast satisfy you at all times. So the first week we were doing this, a young lady came. She said, well, Pastor Blake, I want to ask a question. Is oral sex sin? And, uh, you know, because, you know, I don't see all of the reproductive organs being used and all that. She, you know, so I, you know, gave her a little biblical answer and all that. And she wasn't totally satisfied. That's cool. No problem. I wanted her to know, but I did the best I could. But here's the deal. Like, like the breast man are like mammary glands. They weren't designed for what he just said but they have multi-purpose. <laughs> the text just said that there's multi-purpose, amen? They're designed for memory glands, and they're designed for some other things. That, that, that's in the text, amen? See, a lot of churches now just don't have a sanctuary, they have a multi-purpose center, amen? It means you can play ball in it, you can you know, put, have worship service in it, you can do it all, amen? Check it out, check out the text. And let, watch this, as a loving hind and as graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. Now check out verse 20. Check out verse 20. For why should you, my son, be exhilarated, exact same word, with an adulteress, and embrace the bosom of a foreigner? Now notice this. He just talked about recreational sex from Proverbs 5, 15 to 19. How we ought to enjoy our sex life. But he jumps to 20 and he says, why should you be exhilarated by an adulteress and embrace the bosom of a foreigner? Why? Because if you don't have proper recreational, and when we get to it, protectional sex, you set your mate up for outside opportunities. Y'all, you don't really want to hear this, but I'm going to teach it to you anyway. Here's the deal. When there is a drought, somebody's going to go seek for water. Nobody stays in the desert not looking for water. See, there's a difference if, if a brother is, or a sister is, there's a difference between being greedy and needy. There's a difference because, watch this, your sex life is selfish, not service. So you think you've concluded that once a week is okay. Once every two weeks is okay. That ain't okay for her or for him. 
So where did y'all come together, have a real discussion to determine what is enough? So now somebody's walking around because they're saying, I really prefer three or four times a week. And you're saying, well, once every two weeks is good. And now somebody's mad because they're down some repetitions. <laughs> now, now, y'all, you better follow me here. So now watch this. If I want four a week and you want once every two weeks, we better come to some type of mutual agreement on some halfway medium type program, or we better come up with something to where something is working to where you ain't looking somewhere else. It's amazing to me that I can read in the wisdom literature of Solomon in Proverbs, and he talks about recreational sex and it being blessed, and the very next thing he talks about is here comes this other woman. And when you get to 1 Corinthians 7, he talks about sex being blessed, and then here comes the devil in temptation. So, y'all, realize that this is part of your protective mechanism to not go outside the marriage covenant. It means as a couple, you are supposed to be handling your business to the degree that I can't even think about nobody else. Y'all, always be exhilarated with your wife. Let her breast satisfy you at all times. Hello, somebody? Now, listen, listen, listen. See, y'all want to sing and dance in the church. I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praises uh, shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make a boast in the Lord. The humble will hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. See, y'all want all that. But you don't want, let her breast uh, satisfy me at all times. You know what? In the Hebrew language, in the Hebrew language, it's the same word for all times. That's how deep that is. That's how deep that is. All right? So now, when you're involved in liberty and quality as a blessing inside your matrimony, you're hooked up. Now watch this. Here's the next question. Here we go. Here we go. Here's the question. What would our current culture think was acceptable and appropriate sexually among male and female couples? What would our current culture think was acceptable and appropriate among uh, male and female couples? And what do most people think when they hear a real biblical view of sex versus their cultural reality. All right, y'all got five, six minutes. I gotta have you, I gotta have you, I gotta have you, I gotta have you, oh Lord, I gotta have you. About 20 seconds. All right, all right. Couple of questions, couple of questions. We wanna push through them real fast. Uh, what would our current culture think was acceptable and appropriate sexually among male and female couples? Anybody, anybody, just raise your hand. Right here, right here, right here. Right here. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think that right now in our culture, people who have a secular view of sex believe that they're experiencing true sexual freedom, but they don't, and they look at the biblical view as being prudish or restrictive, but they don't recognize that real freedom isn't rooted in shame or, you know, having to sneak out or worry that you caught something. Like, true freedom is rooted in the way that God created sex to be, but unfortunately, they view that as restricting them from doing what they want to do. Amen. Very good. Very good. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Good one. What our table said is that anything goes. Anything goes. It's promoted through social media. Most of our children are watching YouTube versus watching television, and the ones that are watching television, they're watching Empire, they're watching Star, and they're coming to school and they're asking their teachers, hey, did you watch that last night? No, I didn't. 
because I still can't find really one television show that does not promote a homosexual relationship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So whatever they're seeing at home is not what we were talking about was that back in the day, if you saw something like that, you had the reinforcement to say, the, you know, as far as biblically from your parents or even just from your parents' viewpoint, even if they were not in the church, yeah. that you got the, you got the reinforcement of why that was not okay and no, you're not being raised like that. And, and they what, don't have that now. And what grade are you teaching? Elementary? I school? teach special ed. Uh, elementary? Yeah. Okay. But it's so, the same so, as far so, as in so, middle and high as Yeah, well. so even at the elementary level, kids are already coming and talking about that. Absolutely. Okay. We had two kindergarten boys that had, were, well, when we did have kinder, they were touching their penis heads in the restroom. Okay. So, so you, what you have to understand is the church is way behind. You know, the church is so far behind in this conversation, it doesn't make sense. And so then when you get a pastor as crazy as the one you have, and I actually start teaching what the Bible says, then like folk are like, oh man, like no, you know what, you know, no, I don't know if I want my kid to hear all that and all that. Okay, well they're gonna hear it. And not only are they gonna hear it, they're gonna see it, and there aren't any people putting, you know, parameters on it. And y'all listen to me very carefully. Uh, please don't live your life through your child. Please do not sell your soul's child by living your life through your child. You know, and, and, and thinking that they're, you know, they're not where you are. They're children, and they need to be treated like children. They need to be dealt with like children. Amen? Okay, anybody? Brothers? Brothers' table? We, Joe, y'all were going to go? Well, uh, socially acceptable now, yeah, it's man and woman, that's natural. You know, if really, if, 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 you, if I'm not having sex, something's wrong. Uh, and, and the biblical view... Um, if I'm not having sex, something's wrong. Something's wrong, yeah. Amen? Okay. Something's wrong. Um, and, and, you know, hearing the real biblical view uh, is, is, uh, is, is just behind. You know, well, let me say, hearing, hearing the, the common... A commonly accepted biblical view is just behind, sounds behind. And, and hearing the real biblical view just seems like it's, it's a foreign concept. Because, I mean, you know, guys and girls will go together to get tested. So it's not about being afraid of disease. You know, I'll go with my girl to get tested and make sure we're both negative before we have sex. Mm -hmm. Not, I don't want to catch anything. That's, that's being responsible. Yeah, that's, that's called being responsible, you know. He cares for you when he does that, ladies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, one thing our table said that's acceptable um, in our current culture is uh, just like with verse one saying, you know, a man not touching a woman is good for him not to touch a woman. Like that's obviously acceptable in our culture. Um, you mentioned also in Proverbs about like, uh, so is the one who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her will not go unpunished. That's also celebrated in our culture. Um, shacking up, that's celebrated. Like, you know, Oh, we don't got to get married, things like that. Uh, so that's, that's one, one thing our table mentioned. Now, now, it's celebrated when you start talking about having a woman on the side. That's, the culture celebrates that. They, I mean, like that dude, he's really living the life and all that. Those are the type of movies that are promoted. And those are the type of movies and TV shows that we see. And it subtly kind of works on your heart and on your mind on what you ultimately view as acceptable. You know, um, I'm, I'm not going to even mention the show, but I watched a little show, and now we got the lipstick lesbians on the show. And I'm not trying to hate on nobody or anything like that, but it's like when you, when you go there, you're trying to show people, oh, it's more common, more acceptable. You, you know, you're trying to create, you're trying to take away the, the, the false image of what it used to be viewed as and make it like, hey, we got the lipstick girls doing it. And so dudes are even excited by that. They like that because they, they're the cute girls, so-called, all right? So, so, you know, all that kind of stuff is working on us out there, amen? It's all working on us. Now, here's the deal. When you start thinking about this, how many of you all tonight, as we walk through scripture after scripture, saw that you and I never had consensual sex from God's viewpoint? Now, I mean, like in the dating, we never had consensual sex. You saw it tonight, right? How many of y'all thought, how many of us thought we were having consensual sex and there was no problem with it? 
I mean, like, you know, like, I mean, like, we knew that it might, we were sneaking in, we didn't want mom and dad, I'm, I'm, but, but you never thought that God, when you did that, marked marriage. This, see, 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 you're waiting on a pastor to sign a marriage license. God already saw covenant made. And so when you start looking at what we've been taught, you got to deprogram the Corinthians. You got to deprogram the Corinthians to show them what's better because, like as she was saying earlier, people don't realize all the drama because the world believes that they're living in sexual freedom. We're the ones being repressed. But, you know, is sexual freedom, you know, trying to get the dude to pay child support? Is that sexual freedom? Like the trying to get the dude to pay child support? Now, he was there in the bedroom, but now that child support, Doc, we, we, we know cats that have moved out of, out of the state and took, you know, you pay me on Friday jobs. That, that, that's, that's pastor and crossover Bible fellowship. You, you was with that dude. He was fine and all that. Lifted weights and was squatting and all that. But when you got pregnant and had that baby, that brother rolled to a whole other state and started getting that, that job where he get, just pay me cash on Friday. <laughs> His stuff couldn't be tracked. Dude will do, do, dude will do good to do evil protected himself so he don't have to pay no bills. Amen? So we got to understand what's going on. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 7, verse 4 through 5. 1 Corinthians 7, 4 through 5. Now notice this. He comes back after he deals with the husband, must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. And he gets to verse 4. He says, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise... Also, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time, so that you may uh, devote yourself to prayer and come together again, lest Satan will tempt you due to your lack of self-control. Now watch. Part of the Corinthian sexual responsibility was establishing relational mutuality and sexual compatibility in their state of matrimony. Peak, 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 verse 4. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the, uh, the wife, the husband does not have own authority over his own body, but the wife does. Now, let's talk about this relational mutuality and sexual compatibility. Now, this is where we can get very dangerous inside of a Christian marriage. This can get very dangerous inside of a Christian marriage. Is that when you come and your sex life is motivated by self versus the spirit, you believe you have control over your body. Okay? So when you believe you have control over your body, then now, remember, the two have become one flesh. So when you have control over your body, you are now dividing the body. Because you got control. So... It says, the, the wife does not have authority over her own body, the husband does. The husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Now let's deal with this word authority. Jesus Christ, write this down, Mark 10, 42-45. Write this down, Mark 10, 42-45. Jesus Christ tells the disciples about worldly leadership. And he says, the worldly leaders exercise and dominate their authority over other people. He says, it's not that way among you. And then he comes back and says, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life away as a ransom for many. In other words, Christian leaders don't dominate people when they lead them. They don't exercise dominating authority over the person. So when he turns back and says the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve, although he's the king, he serves. So when he says the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does, he's saying that the body is now used as the service mechanism to the other person in the relationship to come together with relational compatibility. The husband needs to yield his body for service to the wife for the things that she needs. Now, when you have the self mentality, man, I ain't got that kind of drive. 
you know, and so, and so you ain't got that kind of drive. But you got to understand, you don't have authority over your body. The husband does. So now I've got to put myself in spiritual mindset to what does it mean for me to fulfill my duty to him, my, his duty to me, and how do we properly serve each other inside this relationship because I don't have authority over my own body. Now that's hard because women, baby, that's, that's your body. Now dudes, we ain't anybody told us that it was our body besides we was working out in the gym. All right, so... So when he's talking about coming together, God says, you need to know that you're selfish when you think you got authority over your own body. And you and the husband, you and the wife don't come down to mutual agreement. Now watch this. The wife might have a higher sex drive than the husband. Now you can't be talking about you tired. Listen to me. The wife might have a high sex drive. It ain't always the brother with the highest sex drive. So, Doc, you got to step up. You got to get some agreement in, brother. <laughs> brother, you got to say, hey, man. Let me hold up, hold up. <laughs> you got to get some endurance, Doc. Doc, you got to get in the gym, man. You got to get in the gym. Doc, take some B12, some v <laughs> vitamin D or something. Doc, get some vitamins, Doc. So, so you got to make sure you can meet the wife's needs. You don't have authority over your body. She does. She does not have authority over her body. He does. But it's not to be used to dominate the other person. Baby, give me your body. And, you know, you know that, 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 that's not it. That's not it. It's a mutual agreement among the husband and the wife to recognize we need to come together on a regular basis that's mutually agreeing to both of us. So now, what is it that we can come up with this mutually agreeing? And guess what? It may not be like in the movies. They don't have to plan. See, but we got all this sexual view of the movie and all that kind of jazz. Do be in the shower and the, the right light be coming in and all that kind of jazz. And all that, you know, it, you know right light be hitting them. Right, water going all the, you know, and, they, you know, and they're doing all that. Y'all, and we on some tired stuff, hey, amen. We, we just tired, hey, amen. Bernie Mac said, that's all I got. You know what I'm saying? That's all I got. So, so, so here's the deal. You got to make sure between husband and wife that you have relational mutuality. Listen to me. This is, very, this is very serious right here. You don't have authority over your body. She does. You don't have authority over your body. He does. So now how do we work together as mutual heads inside this body called marriage to properly love each other. That's what the couple got to get to. That might be a discussion. That might be a whole weekend conversation. You know, I mean, but we got to get to something because here's what's happening. People have not had that discussion and as a result, they sexually frustrated in marriage. And then you wondering why all of a sudden somebody says something to somebody and dude gone. Now, at the exact same time, brothers, she did get her hair done. Don't acknowledge it. She did get some new nail color. Don't acknowledge it. And I know you all that, but let Kunta Kente Mandingo on the job. Say, I noticed you got some new fingernail color. Oh, you did? Yeah, 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 I like that's nice, nice. And he walk away, the rest of the day she ain't working. She your wife, but she thinking about the dude that noticed the nails. Be, be unromantic if you want to. See, because we just want to get to the end result. Yo, they got a process. We don't have process, amen. We like, hey, hey, hey. They, they got a process to get that thing, you know, they, you know. So, so, so here's the deal. Brothers, I'm trying to help somebody tonight. You better recognize that hair. You look nice in that, baby. Now, you know she gained 12 pounds. You look nice in that, baby. Looks good on you. Looks good. Baby, I like a little more meat on that thing. You know what I'm saying? 
When I eat chicken, I don't ever eat legs. I eat thighs. I eat thighs. When the last time you see me eat some legs? I ain't never ate no legs. All right? So, so watch this. So here's the deal. She got the text. He says, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. And likewise, the wife doesn't have authority over her own body, but he does. So he says, get down to some sexual compatibility. Now, check this out, and this will probably take us home for the night. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again, lest Satan tempt you due to your lack of self-control. Here's the last thing. The Corinthians were also to understand that sexual intimacy and frequency, here's the deal, this is quantity now. This is not just quality, this is quantity. The Corinthians were also to, to understand that sexual intimacy and frequency was the preventative pill to fight off a satanic attack of their lack of spirituality. All right, now, other day, some folks start getting sick in the house, and, you know, I'm already taking my little medicines and all that, I mean, my little vitamins and all that. Like, I increased that thing because I ain't trying to get what they got. So I got some stuff in the house. I started, you know, like 1,000 milligrams, 2,000 milligrams, you know. They only take 5,000, 500 a day. I'm on like 8,000 milligrams, all right? Now, start turning the orange and all that. So, so, so here's the deal. So God says stop depriving one another. Now, remember, we had to get to this compatibility and this relational mutuality and all that. See, so understand this. When he says stop depriving somebody and the couple has not determined the moment of deprivation. The couple in your own relational situation have your own wife, your own husband. So when he says own wife, own husband, among that own wife, own husband, they have to determine among themselves what is right for them. So somebody else, they may be in college on the seven-day, 20-meal plan. Y'all remember that meal plan in college where, you, you know, your mama, you know, you go to the dormitory, they, you, get to, you take your little card, you go to college, set Monday through Sunday you can eat up to 20 meals. That means you got to get one meal by yourself. But, but, but you know, and then there'd be people who had the five-day, you know, like 15-meal plan. They, they, you know, the weekends, they on their own. You better determine what meal plan y'all got. See, 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 my mom and dad and I would sit down and we would determine what was the best meal plan for Blake to make it through college. Because we ain't going to be sending you no whole bunch of extra money. So you better get this regular meal plan right here. So each couple, own wife, own husband, have to determine inside your home what's right. So that you don't get to levels of deprivation. Stop depriving one another. Now y'all, this is Bible. So if you've not met to the come, come to the point on what is relational mutuality and sexual compatibility, that's a good homework assignment. Why? Because of the next part of the verse. Lest Satan tempt you due to your lack of self-control. The Corinthian church thought they were so mature because of spiritual giftedness, but yet in the marriage, they wasn't coming through in that bedroom. And you know what he says? I'm going to show you how immature you really are. When it comes down to this basic thing called marriage, you don't know how to handle it. You know how to worship. You know how to fall out. You know how to speak in tongues. You got all the gifts in the world, but you can't even handle your marriage. Don't be telling me you all deep and you can't handle your marriage. This is, this is a good Bible. So he says, here's why Satan tempts you. Not because she looks better. Not because she's cuter. Because of your lack of self-control. Now, what fed into my lack of self-control? Because self-control is both of us. Deprivation. Second, Tim Second Timothy chapter 3 says, in the last days, men will lack self-control. That's 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Men will lack self-control. So make sure that your mate is not in a position to be out of control. This, this good book right here. Y'all, please understand. Y'all, all this going once a month, if that's what y'all have agreed on, man, bless your family. That's not the blessing in my family, but that's the blessing in your family. Amen? Y'all got to determine. But y'all, don't have folk walking around mad in the crib. Now, y'all, ladies, I'm going to just tell y'all. Y'all, you don't want to really hear me, 
But anytime y'all walk by in anything, we believe it's opportunity. Y'all, it's just, it's just a reaction. We just built differently, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm just going to bed. I'm tired. No, no, baby, I thought that you know, you had that on. <laughs> Y'all, so you got to understand where this thing is. Lest Satan tempt you due to your lack of self-control. You don't want to put your mate, male and or female, husband and or wife, in a position because of deprivation in the bedroom to where they're looking elsewhere. Right. Now watch, here's the question. Is your sex life spirit-led, self-led, or Satan-led? Watch how when it's self-led, it leads to satanic-led. When there's no mutual agreement, no compatibility, you know, you got your own body and I got my own body and all that, and we don't agree, I, we just different. Okay, so we never got to agreement of same. I mean, we're different, but you got my name on the checkbook. We're different, though. <laughs> we're different, though. So, so watch. It leads to Satan tempting. And watch this. He ultimately says lack of self-control. The ninth fruit of the Spirit the very last one to where you have the ability to control yourself and to resist things because the Spirit of God is moving in you so well. And in essence, is there a possibility that there's a depletion of the Holy Spirit just be because there's the same depletion of the sex life? So this is God laying this thing out. Anytime your sex life is self-driven, single, you're in immorality. Married, you'll be in immorality. You catch that? Single, because, of, you know, it's not good for a man to touch a woman. He lacks self-control. It ends up in immorality. Married couple, where does it end up? Immorality. And who's running the whole show the whole time? Self and Satan. When God... In the spirit and the scriptures, we're supposed to be designing us this way. The question is, where will we line up? Where will we line up as couples in terms of saying this is where we want to be? Where will I line up in terms of being a young lady, a young man who says, no, I'm not trying to fall in this area 95th time. I'm not, I'm not trying to do that. Y'all, you all said something earlier. Um, people say, man, something wrong with you, man, when, when you ain't trying to have sex. So we had some young men that we had taught, and young ladies we had taught in our youth ministry about the biblical view of sex, and young man goes off to college, and he's a virgin, and all that kind of jazz, and the young ladies were trying to hit on him, and, and uh, he called me back. He said, Pastor Blake, man, they calling me gay, man. I said, why are they calling you gay, doc? He said, man, they, they calling me gay because I told them I was a virgin, and they, oh, there's something wrong with him, something wrong with him. Brother was, brother was a virgin. But because the brother was a virgin and walking with the Lord and had heard the Bible teachings, and y'all played ball for Westfield, been in the Astrodome, played big time college ball, player of the week, virgin, but yet he was, he, he was gay. But here's the deal. You know, I've been in some relationships. I told you I drove all the way down to Austin. <laughs> so the next girl I was dating wasn't Renique just right away. I dated a girl in between that. And so when I started dating that girl, I was like, hey, hey, I, I, I've already been hurt. I'm saying so I'm, I'm trying to maintain myself, all right? I'm, I'm already wounded. <laughs> Brother, just getting over an ulcer, all right? So I ain't, got all, I ain't got time for all that. So, man, first couple dates, man, you know, drop her off at the house, all that. Then all of a sudden, brother was gay. Now, I ain't never been called gay like my whole life. Is, is there something wrong with you? I was like, what, what do you mean something wrong with me? I mean, I just want to know if you're gay. We're going to go down on two dates and you ain't trying nothing. Two days? So then you know what? Brother got to prove himself, amen? <laughs> so, y'all, we struggling out here in this world. It's, it's hard on a player out here, amen, when you try to do the things that God told you to do. So, y'all, the reality is, is that we got to recognize that when we're out here in this world, there are things that are going to draw people away. And when you're self-led, not spirit-led, and when you're Satan-led, you'll be all jacked up. Amen? Let's pray.
Father, thank you for tonight, Lord, and I pray that we'll continue to build off of this.